All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer again. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless your name. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for blessing us in every way in Christ. I pray now that you speak to your people, even through my weakness. May they hear from the scriptures and have illumination from the Holy Spirit. We honor you. We thank you for all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning again, one and all. Be praying for me, like I said. <laughs> Some weakness, but that's fine. This morning we're going to be in Romans 5, again, 15 to 21. We're going to attempt to get to the end of the chapter. And this is what the blessed apostle by the Holy Spirit recorded for us. He said, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law ended that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the word of the Lord. We have two titles to our message. Number one, the free gift is unlike the offense. The free gift is unlike the offense. And number two, Adam and Christ contrasted. Adam and Christ contrasted. And we'll begin this way. Men and women <laughs> naturally are without strength to be righteous. Thus, God says, they are ungodly, they are sinners, and their minds are at enmity with God. And that is to say, they won't agree with God, and God won't agree with them. And this is the human natural spiritual condition. And men and women cannot rise above this condition of powerlessness and unrighteousness by anything that they will and can do. But that does not mean that they won't try. They will try to be righteous by the strength of their own flesh. But the problem still remains 
they do not know or understand who they are as far as God sees them and thus do not know God's way of dealing with sin and sinners. God has a way of dealing with sin and sinners. And unfortunately, many professing Christians are still in the category of those who are ignorant of God's way, ignorant of God's righteousness. And the, the beloved apostle, Apostle Paul, is laboring the doctrine of justification. That is, how does a sinner like you and me find or acquire such a standing with God, not with men, not with angels, but with God, so that he sees or regards us as righteous. In other words, how does God deal with sinners in a way that is acceptable to him? How does he accept sinners? Period. That's the question. A way that will prevent him from sending all men and women to hell. There has to be a way. Because there is a way that he proposed to do things. And that is the way that he has presented to us in the gospel testimony. God has always had a solution or the solution to the problem of the sinner's justification before him. And that solution is captured is presented, is given in what he calls the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, in which his righteousness has been revealed and testified of by the law and the prophets. And it is a righteousness that is apart from the law. The law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, testifies of one thing, the righteousness of God. And that means it testifies of Christ. And that is why when we go to the Old Testament, we always preach Christ because that's the testimony of the law and the prophet. So this righteousness that has been revealed, righteousness is not something that you work for. It is revealed to you and is given to you. And that means it is apart from human obedience of any kind. Even if that obedience is caused by God in the person, even if God were to cause you to obey something, that's not the righteousness. This is the righteousness that has been accomplished has been done outside of the person who needs the justification. And God says it is the righteousness that is by the faithfulness of Christ Jesus, the faithfulness of Christ to God in perfect obedience. So it is a righteousness that was already done, a righteousness that was already freely given to as many as should have it called the elect, the church of Christ, the saints, the sheep. They all have this righteousness. And in this way of doing righteousness, righteousness by another person. God maintains his integrity. He does not compromise his holiness and righteousness in calling sinners righteous. 
And we know from the scriptures that God is no respecter of persons. And he is surely not gangster. Okay? <laughs> God is not gangster. God is not a politician. That's the righteousness that has been accomplished and given is given on just grounds. That is in fulfillment of all the righteous demands that were imposed on the sinner. That the sinner unfortunately could not do. And God has done things this way so that he may be, in the language of Romans, the just and the justifier of those who come to him by Christ Jesus. So Christ appeared and died to accomplish this righteousness and to make it available. And God imputed it, accounted it to his people so that God's elect now have peace with him. They have peace with God. These who naturally are the young and the restless and may occasionally suffer from restless leg syndrome. I never heard of restless leg syndrome until I came to the States. I'm watching a TV commercial and they're talking about restless leg syndrome. And suddenly I am starting to feel restless leg syndrome. <laughs> That's what they do you. These who were the young and the restless, with respect to God, we are very young, <laughs> right? We are children. We enjoy peace with him because we have a standing. We have access to him through his grace in Christ Jesus. And Christ is the center, the mediator of the whole transaction of your coming to God. In monetary terms, we would say Christ is the only legal tender when it comes to the matter of God's dealing with sinners and salvation. He is the only allowable currency in which to trade spiritual things. Every other currency of righteousness is illegal. It will send you to jail. Okay? And what Paul is working in this testimony is that do not take the name of Christ for granted as you are reading the book of Romans or any scripture for that matter because not all people are persuaded about God's testimony of him. Not all are persuaded that the law is not the way of making peace and reconciliation with God. So there will always be objections to God's gospel. And Paul here is also responding to objections. Right from chapter 1, there will always be objections. And the Holy Spirit is working the truth of the gospel through those objections. Okay? And people object to the gospel because it makes nothing of human obedience, makes nothing of human works. So Paul comes and says, the matter of justification or the justification of the sinner happened already and outside of ourselves. And it happened when we were without strength and ungodly and were not looking for it. And it happened in due time, and that means in the God-appointed time. 
in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he may redeem those under the law. And Paul says the act of self-sacrifice by Jesus was much more than the best of men could conceive or be willing to do even for a seemingly righteous person. And yet God's grace was and is amplified in that Christ died for a people who were not even close to being good, who were not even trying to be good, but they were sinners, they were lawbreakers, yeah, and they were happy in their law breaking. Romans 5, 9 to 10. If you're paying attention, you would have seen that I was kind of summarizing Romans 5, verse 1 to 8. <laughs> Romans 5, 9 to 10, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We have now, at the present time, been justified by his blood. And that means the death of Christ was the place and time of justification because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And that means there's no cancellation of sin. And that means your account remains loaded with sin and its judgment if that remission does not happen. But when it did happen, then your account was also canceled. The, the debt could not be paid and still remain in debt. There's no transaction like that. That's gangster. That's mafia. Okay? But the Holy Spirit says all the believers were justified. They were declared as righteous by the blood of the cross and not by the works of the law. That is the contrast that Paul is working in the background. He has a background that he's working with. Okay? And he is presenting to the Roman saints that this is the way of salvation. It's not about the law. It's about Christ. It's about the cross. And because of that justification, the redeemed shall be saved from the wrath of God that is yet to come, but is surely coming. God has promised judgment, a fiery judgment on sinners. So the wrath of God is coming. And this salvation from God's wrath is through him, that is Christ. It is through Christ, that you have salvation from the wrath to come. Which means as soon as one removes Christ from this conversation, chip away at him in this matter to any degree, then the wrath of God must be poured on them. Remember Paul's letter to the Galatians who because of the Judaizers were beginning or were adding seemingly good things to Christ, seemingly good things to grace, to try and improve on Jesus. Paul came and screamed hellfire on them and said, who has bewitched you? You have been bewitched to want to add anything to perfection. To add anything to Christ. That is another gospel. And he says, if you do that, 
If you add anything to Christ, Christ will profit you nothing. You have fallen from grace. You cannot add anything to Jesus. You cannot add anything to a cup that is already full without emptying some of the contents. But the redeemed have not that problem with God's wrath. As they exist in a state of justification from it. God's justification of them has made them not guilty of their sins, which would have been a problem for them just like the rest. But Christ's intercession by his blood satisfied that wrath on their behalf. The intercession of Christ is what makes the difference. Christ standing between hell and yourself. That's the difference. The nails card hands and feet. They alone stand between you and hell and nothing else does. But how much satisfaction did Christ give to ashes? And this is an Old Testament teaching of the burnt sacrifices. They were burned to the ashes. Ella and I have been burning a lot of firewood. We have a ton of ashes. If we want us to do Ash Wednesday, we could probably do Ash Wednesday for the whole neighborhood and still have more ashes to use. <laughs> God's wrath was satisfied like a fire is with ashes that it cannot burn anymore. No one is able to light up ashes. Doesn't matter how much fuel you put. You can put 2,000 gallons of fuel. All you'll be doing is just burning the fuel, but not the ashes. The ashes do not burn. Why? Because they represent God's satisfaction because of Christ Jesus, who became the burnt and sin offering on our behalf. That is how much God is satisfied with Christ. And that is how much he is satisfied with you in Christ. Verse 10, Romans 5. Paul says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 9 told us that because we were justified by his blood, we shall be saved from God's wrath in judgment. But Paul continued with the emphasis with, with, the emphasis with almost a parallelism, repeating the same point in a different way and said, God reconciled us. Verse 9, God justified us by his blood. In verse 10, God reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, which is a reference to the cross in both cases. When we were enemies, that's when the reconciliation happened. That's when the justification happened. So God placed or places both the justification and reconciliation at the cross at the death of his son, and by the death of his son, and says, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, his resurrected life. Saved from wrath by his resurrected life because he is the judge of the dead and the living. He has to be there on judgment day to say, he is mine, she is mine, I paid for it. 
I paid for him. He has to be there. That's why the resurrection is also important. Because you can't have an advocate who does not show up in court. That's not going to help your case. He has to be there. So all judgment was given to him by the Father. So that all should honor the Son as the Father is honored. That's Jesus in John 5, 23. All judgment has been given to the Son. But this judge, whoever lives, is also the high priest. He is the advocate for those who were given him by the Father. The judge and the advocate are the one person for the redeemed. And that is a very scandalous situation, if you ask me. In human terms, people would say that is a rigged legal system. That is corruption. You cannot have the judge being the advocate. Because what is happening is, as the judge, he will read the charges and say, you are guilty. But then, as the advocate, he stands and defends you from himself. We did a message. There's an extended message on this, I think, from Psalm 50. Very good one. But that's the scandal of the gospel. That the one who has been appointed to judge you is the very one who was also appointed to defend you from the judgment. So you never get to speak. You should not be speaking. In the matter of God, his court is a court of righteousness. But we see also the sovereignty and power of God at work. Who could be better judge than the Lord Jesus? Who could be a better advocate than the Lord Jesus? Could it be the late John Cochrane? <laughs> no, not in the matters of salvation. There's only one qualified judge and advocate, and that is Christ. And God says to the redeemed, knowing all this, rejoice. Be happy, even in trials and tribulations, because your real problem has been taken care of for you. It is well with your soul. You have the best deal imaginable in this created universe. But how did we get here? How did men and women become sinners to need redemption? Did they eat too much dark chocolate? <laughs> no, something happened. A transaction happened that was outside of themselves. Something happened. Romans 5, verse 12. This is what happened. Adam happened to you. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. As justification, grace, reconciliation, peace with God happened through the death of the one man, Christ Jesus, through another man, a one man, sin entered the world, and with it, death in tow. When sin entered or enters, it does not ever come alone. It always has some other partner in tow. 
in Zimbabwe and other places in the world. If you invite one person to a party, like Katie had a baby shower yesterday, do not think they're coming alone. So, oh, can you come to my party? Okay, invite one person. No, they're not coming alone. <laughs> they bring two or three, even four more people with them. Almost always. And sin always brings death with it. Because the wages of sin is death. They come together. They are inseparable. In other words, men and women have found themselves in a predicament that they did not individually cause. You did not do anything to find yourself in the situation that you are in. In many ways, sin and death was Adam's inheritance to us as his children. This is what Adam left us for an inheritance, a bad inheritance of sin, death, and condemnation. But the sin of Adam and its consequence or consequences did not end with him. God was pleased to account it to all men without exception of all who were born of the man of the dust. And we say that this is how God determined to deal with the matter. This is going to be a learning message of putting things together so that you have a sense of what is happening in the conversation of the gospel. This was God's way of doing things to make all guilty even of something that they did not do but with a much higher end or glorious end in mind. God was not being capricious. In Adam, God united all men under the one man. Thus, Adam was made representative of all humanity by God's decree. So the purpose of accounting sin and death to all men was for God to establish three doctrines. God was being purposeful in the way that he was doing this. He was establishing the doctrines of union, representation, or substitution, and imputation. The only way that something that someone did can come and affect you personally in the matter of debt or some benefit is if you are legally united with that person in some way and the law recognizes representation as legitimate by that other person who has been chosen to represent you. And in the light of that, there would be just legal grounds to impute or to account something to you, whether good or bad. So in this matter, Adam brought the side A of this record, and it is not a good side, <laughs> okay? But it has to be said, having gone through Adam, having been united to Adam in some way, we should perish the thought of ever doing the law for righteousness, to God's satisfaction 
It's impossible. If we're born in Adam, it's impossible to earn your salvation, impossible to keep the law, it's impossible to be perfect. So that's where we find ourselves in Adam, in a hopeless situation from which we need redemption, from which we need to be ransomed, we need to be set free. So what then? Romans 5, 15 to 18, that is our text for today. To 21, sorry. 15 to 21. To the solution. But the free gift is not like the offense. So the contrast between Adam and Christ continues. Remember Christ Jesus brought reconciliation, grace, peace, salvation, from God's wrath and justification, and Adam brought sin and death. And Paul says the free gift, the charisma, is not like the offense. They are different. Though they be transacted in the representative individuals. But how different are they? For if by one man's offense many died, by the offense, the disobedience of the one man, Adam, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Christ Jesus, abounded to many. Much more is saying what? He's saying to a greater degree, by far. The grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man who is called Jesus far exceeds the offense and what that offense caused or brought about. The gift of God in Christ far exceeds the offense. See, the emphasis is on the grace of God, which means the settlement of your sin is only dealt with adequately by the grace of God, which means by the doing of God. The grace of God means by God doing it. <laughs> and the gift by the grace of the one man, Christ Jesus, and not by anything that you can do. And there's no conversation of Mary, the mother of Jesus, here. Mary cannot help you. Because I know in Roman Catholic catechism, they talk of Mary being full of grace. No, she is not full of grace. God alone is full of grace. Mary was a grace case. She was a sinner. Like you and I. But what is Paul saying? Paul is saying to try and do something about your sin only leaves you stuck with the one man, stuck in the one man Adam. In other words, hopeless. And that is why children do not change their own messy diapers. Okay? But there seems to be repetition here. Here, this verse 15. The grace of God, that is the charisma of God, and the gift, that is the Doria, D-O-R-E-A, by the grace, charisma of the one man. The gift is a translation from Doria, which is a synonym of grace, but in this context is denoting the gift of the sovereign. Grace is a gift of the sovereign. And if God bestows grace, and the one man, Christ Jesus, also bestows grace, 
then it means what? It means Christ is God. Because God alone is the giver of grace. And God alone loses nothing in the giving of anything. If you and I give something, something is subtracted from our account. Whether $100, $200, doesn't matter the amount. But not with God. When God gives, he gives freely and yet remains unchanged. <laughs> Nothing is subtracted from him. God will give you the whole world and still nothing is subtracted from him. Now, let's talk a little about the many in the conversation of Adam and the many in Christ. The many who died in Adam are the many whom he represented. And that means all humanity. Because we know for sure that all men died or die as evidence of their participation or union with Adam. But in the matter of the grace of God and the gift that abounds to the many, who are the many who are made partakers of God's grace? It is the many who are in Christ. The many who were chosen in Christ and given to him. It is the many whom he died for that he calls the sheep in John 10. I give my life for the sheep. So the many in both statements of Adam and Christ are not equivalent, are not saying a one-to-one -one mapping of all those who are in Christ. Being, sorry, of all those who are in Adam being saved in Christ. In other words, when I say one-to-one -one mapping, I'm saying I have five fingers here. If you do one-to-one -one mapping, I'm going to end up with five fingers on the right. That's one-to-one -one mapping. So if you have five people in Adam condemned, and these represent the many, and you have the many in Christ, this many is not saying five to five. The many in Christ are those who are in Christ. There could be three. There could be two. Okay? It's not saying one to one. This we know because Paul is going to expand on the doctrine of election in Romans 9. Okay? We also know that not all are saved. And so Paul is not teaching universalism in Romans 5. And universalism is the idea that Christ died to save everyone and all shall be saved in the end, including Judas. Okay? Paul's emphasis on grace and gift is saying this whole matter is not because of human decision or human effort. The gift was not and is not given to be made effectual by the decision of the sinner. It is still in the hands of the sovereign God to bestow it. Remember, it happened when the sinner was without strength. That's the number who benefit from the gift are not restricted by human decision, willingness or stubbornness, but by God and his election. So election is what limits the movement of the many. 
Because not all who are in Adam are elect, but all who are in Christ are the elect. And who determines that it is God. But Paul continued with his parallelism and said, verse 16, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. And the literal rendering is, of verse 16, Also, not as through the one who sinned is the gift. Also, not as through the one who sinned is the gift. In other words, the gift did not come through the same person who brought sin and death. And that is it. The gift was never to come from Adam. Not by his obedience or his intercession because it was never his to bring. The gift of inheritance, of eternal life, of blessing was always to come by God's grace and Christ's grace, which also implies the sin was always in view, was always in the picture, in the purpose of God. So when Christ, the bringer of the gift, and who also was the gift, when he came, he delivered the gift to his people. He saved his people from sin that was the gift. So much that the believing of his people is not the condition for the giving of the gift. Your believing is not what brings the gift, but it evidences your possession of the gift. Your believing evidences to you, not to God, but God already knows. <laughs> it evidences to you your possession of that gift of Christ. For the judgment, Paul continues. Judgment, the Greek word is kata. K-A-T-A, which came from the offense, resulted in condemnation. Condemnation is katakrima, K-A-T-A-K-R-I-M-A. -A -A. I rarely ever do this, but it's important for our teaching for you to see and know the difference. Condemnation is katakrima. Judgment is kata. Judgment and condemnation are related but are not the same thing. Judgment can result in one of two outcomes. Condemnation or justification. And God made a determination as the judge in judgment, that is in the weighing of facts. That's what a judge does. They hear the story, they weigh the facts. Then they make a determination to convict or to acquit, okay? To condemn or to justify. So God made a determination as a judge, as a result of Adam's sin, Okay? And he passed a sentence, a verdict of condemnation. Condemnation on all men. And that to say, Adam did not just bring sin and death. He brought to himself and all men, without exception, condemnation, which is the sentence. See, 
that emphasis is being put on the one offense. And it was not even a complicated offense as you and I could imagine it. It would not have made any headline news in our time with, with respect to what we know as sin, but it was a serious offense as evidenced by God's sentencing of it and the level of sentencing of it. And God did not say to Adam, Adam, my son, take it easy, dude. <laughs> Slow down. Be careful of that woman next time. Don't listen to her. Don't leave her playing on an iPad for too long by herself. <laughs> but for now, let us sweep this one under the carpet. Let's forget about this mishap. This seemingly small mistake. No. A breaking of commandment is a breaking of the whole law and it attracts God's condemnation. And this is a matter that is still not understood by many professing Christians. They do not get this matter of law because they'll come and say, oh, but we do the law just to show our love. No, the law was given with a very specific purpose, and it was not for you to show your love. <laughs> it was to condemn you by that which is good because of sin. That's Paul in Romans 7. But he says, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. See what has happened. Adam, by the one offense, brought condemnation to all men. And that is to say, if we're born of a woman, you legally passed through Adam. You had to pass through Adam one way or the other. But it does not end there. There was a free gift that was given in light of not just the offense of Adam and the condemnation that came by it, but also the many offenses. Remember, as you are going through the text, it's one offense, one offense, one offense. But when it comes to the giving of the gift, it seems to cover more than the offense of Adam. It covers also the many offenses. In other words, your many sins. Every one of them was and is taken care of by the gift that is Christ Jesus. The gift that is Christ took care of the condemnation of all your sins of all time. Okay? But it does not do that to all men, but to only those who are the elect of Christ or in Christ. Okay? And that's why Paul used the language of much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of God of the one man, Christ Jesus, abounded to many. The gift resulted in justification. In other words, a reversal of what Adam brought to the elect. Sin brought us to actually a higher standing than we were even in sinless Adam. Someone is going to have to hear this correctly. It is through sin that we now possess the righteousness of Christ. It is through sin that we now have a status that is higher than that of the innocent Adam. Because we possess the righteousness of God. 
before Adam sinned, he had the righteousness of the man of the dust. And that righteousness could not benefit you anything. So when you look at sin in the proper way, you see that it is a glorious aspect of the purpose of God. It is through our sinning that we now, by imputation, possess the righteousness of God. So sin has become our stepping stool to the righteousness of God. That is the wisdom of God. So justification is the heart of this matter of Christ with respect to us. That is the central issue through which Christ was and is introduced to his elect. The justification, the righteousness of the elect. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Luke says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Through this man, Christ Jesus. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Through this man, you are justified from all sins which you could not be justified from by the law of Moses, which means Christ is higher than Moses. Christ is higher than the Ten Commandments, by far. And Paul continues and introduced a third parallelism that combines the first two ideas in verse 15 and 16, and he puts them together in verse 17, but with a slight difference. This is what he said in verse 15 and 16. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Christ Jesus, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. We have a difference in degree in verse 16. There's a difference in kind between death and life. Death is one mode of existence and life. Death there is speaking to condemnation. And life is speaking to salvation and justification. And in verse 17, he combines both ideas and says, For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, death reigned is to say death is a ruler of humanity through Adam. Everyone succumbs to it. Death has not only overcome men and women, but has also kept them in such perpetual fear from which they will and can only be delivered from by Christ Jesus. As the Hebrews writer said, Hebrews 2, 14 to 15, hear this.
Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. So that's speaking to the incarnation of the Logos, Christ adding humanity to himself. And for this reason, that through death, that he may die, that Christ added human nature to himself, that he may die, that through his death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. So death is destroyed by death. But, de but, but by the death of a sinless being, Christ Jesus, death is removed by death. The death of death in Christ. And that is... The devil, him who had the power of death, that is the devil, because he's the one who brought it to Adam and Eve through his evil schemes. And listen to verse 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That is the condition of all men and women at Across the world, they are afraid of death. They've been made subject to bondage because they are ignorant of Christ. That's the reason. Death has men and women in bondage. And as some singer remarked, even among the professing Christians, many want to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. <laughs> They want to find some other way to go to heaven, but they don't want it to happen through death. And I can understand that because even flies are afraid of death. You ever try to kill a fly? As soon as they feel the wind coming their way, they are already off. They are gone. They are afraid of death. Okay. All creatures are afraid of death. They run for dear life. But in contrast of the death reigning through Adam, ruling through Adam, there is good news of another king. Because here death is being presented to us as a king who reigns and yet is introduced to us another king a more powerful king, a better king, who brings good news. And Paul says, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Those who receive, those given by God's grace, the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign not in death, but in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Paul repeatedly connects everything salvation to the one Christ Jesus. You're reigning over death is only going to happen in him because he has life in himself. You and I don't have life in ourselves. Christ Jesus did not need to eat food to live. He had life in himself. He said that in John, 7, John 10, I have life in myself. Okay? The Father has given commandment is that I have life in myself and I have the power to put it down to cause my own death and to resurrect myself. How do you die and resurrect yourself? <laughs> because he had power in himself to do that. You and I don't have that power. So that is the power that we have in him to reign over death. 
And when we do that, we are reigning in life and righteousness. Okay? But this is what the text is not saying about the reigning in life. This is not saying that the grace of God is being given to people for them to choose so that they can receive it. Okay? Let me read where I'm getting this from. Much more those who receive in a lot of Christian circles, once you say receive, oh, I receive it, man of God, I receive it. I receive it. <laughs> that is not saying. The grace is being given for you and I to choose to receive it or to refuse it. That cannot be imposed on the text without losing the context. Grace is not offered. Grace is imposed. It is bestowed. Grace cannot be invited. It invites itself. Okay? Also, to say all the elect the redeemed from Adam who reign in life is not saying they will win the Olympics because of Jesus. It is not saying they will take over the White House because these things are circling in the Christian cycles. It is not saying because of Christ. We are going to take over the White House. We are going to Christianize the world. Otherwise, Christ will not come. Or starting or running successful businesses in the name of Jesus. Don't do that. Don't do that. That is not the context. This conversation is way higher than all these things. The conversation is about eternal, imperishable things. Things that do not perish with the using. The context is a contrast between death as God's judgment in Adam and life as possessing the righteousness of Christ, of being justified and not being under the judgment of condemnation. That's the conversation. Now, to how the free gift and righteousness came about. Fourth, fourth contrast, verse 18, Romans 5 still. Therefore, as through one man's Offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. We know how Adam got us into sin and death and condemnation. It was by the eating of the tree or from the tree that God commanded him not to eat. And yet God has said, in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. In the day that you shall eat of this tree, this will happen to you immediately. You shall surely die. So in the day that Adam ate of the tree, sin and death and condemnation came to him and to all men. In that moment, and with respect to Christ, justification of life came how? 
by his one righteous act. Death, sin, condemnation by the one righteous, one unrighteous act of Adam. Justification of life by the one righteous act of Christ. What is that in reference to? That is the cross. That is the death of the cross. Adam, pay attention. Adam, in the day of his spiritual death, brought sin, death, and condemnation. Christ Jesus, in the day of his death, brought life and righteousness to all who are in him. That is the connection. In the day that you eat, this will happen. And that look into Christ, who in the day of his death would also bring life and righteousness, justification of all those who are in him. That is what he accomplished for all who are in him. And that is why when the Christ died, Let's reverse the gears. One second. When Adam and Eve ate, they immediately found themselves to be naked. In the day that the Jesus, the Christ died, what did the Roman soldiers do? They found themselves with the clothes of Jesus. There is an addressing that is happening in the Garden of Eden, and there is a dressing that is happening at the cross. The Roman soldiers, the Gentiles, they found themselves in possession of the garments of Christ that had the blood of Christ, the covering, the righteousness of Christ. In the day that he died, in the day of Adam, nakedness came. In the day of Christ's death, a covering with the righteousness of Christ was given. So don't just say, oh, Jesus accomplished salvation. What does that mean, man? You have to explain what it means. He covered his people with the righteousness of his blood. Yeah? Romans 5, 19-21. For as, by one's, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Here, Young's literal translation of verses 18 and 19. So then, as through one offense, to all men, it is to condemnation. So also, through one declaration of righteous, it is to all men to justification of life. For as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were constituted sinners. So also, through the obedience of the one, shall the many be constituted righteous. All this is happening outside of yourself. The condemnation did not come because you did something. And in like manner, the righteousness, the justification came not because he did anything. They both happened outside of you. You were just caught in the middle of the transaction. <laughs> and you happened to be a beneficiary of how God determined to do things. This is not being communicated. I'm not even lying to you. This is not being communicated clearly. 
So the many of the elect shall be constituted righteous. In other words, declared righteous not by their faith, but as righteous in judgment by reason of Christ's justification of them on the cross. So the final judgment is not for you to be made righteous. The final judgment is for the vindication of the righteousness that you already possess. Okay? God is only bringing you to confirm to all the denizens of his creation to say, these are my righteous people. That's the final judgment. It's not a way to see if Sean will be able to make it in or not. Oh, he could have just made it this week. No, no. That's not how it works. The final judgment is for the vindication for God's elect, okay, of the righteousness that they already possess in Christ. And these things are not understood in what passes for gospel. And that is why there's so much conditionalism, even from some who claim to be sovereign grace. They are missing very simple and yet important foundational understanding of union, representation, and the implications of them. Once you are united to Adam, what does that mean? If you are united to Christ, what does that mean? You possess what God has given you in Christ. It has nothing to do with your works, nothing to do with your behavior, nothing to do with your improvement in anything. Your improvement in anything does not affect the transaction or lack of. So this is what is being said. In Adam came sin, death and condemnation to all men without exception because he was in union with all and he represented all. This is the legal status that all acquired by being in him and standing in him no matter how briefly they passed through him. It is because of passing through Adam that you are said to have been captives to sin. That is how sin and death reigned over you. Those things, those words don't mean anything if you never pass through Adam. This is how you got spiritually blind, deaf and lame, and this is why you need to be born again. Yeah? But thank God there is a side B of the matter. For those who know how to, who know odd records, you have a side B and side A. Down side A, you flip it, put it on side B. Okay, you put the needle <laughs> and you play the music. The girls bought me a um, vinyl player for my birthday. I have to play it for you. You are yet to hear. And, and mommy got me some Michael Jackson's albums. And I'm like, okay. So we're going to be playing Michael Jackson later. <laughs> <laughs> On the side B of the matter, Christ Jesus appeared as the head of the new humanity of the elect, as the new creation. The side A becomes the old creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new because we have flipped the record to side B. Okay? So, Christ is the head of the new humanity of the elect. And he appeared outside of Adam to redeem, to set free those of his people who were mad in Adam. For this reason, 
Christ was not mad in Adam. But Mary was mad in Adam. And the only way to circumvent Jesus being mad from Adam was what the Holy Spirit said, he shall be holy and be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And some foolish person who say, but God does not believe in the humanity of Christ. They said it a few weeks ago. Because if you say that to Christians, they're like, oh, wow, what a heretic. Uh, kill him. You know they're making it up because of their hardness of heart and blindness. Christ Jesus was 100% human, but not as the man of the dust. He was the spiritual man from heaven and was surely not formed in Adam. This is 1 Corinthians 15 teaching. Go and read 1 Corinthians teaching. There is a contrast between the man of the dust who brought corruption, sin, and death, and the man from heaven, the spiritual man conceived of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Just because Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit does not remove the reality of his humanity. His humanity was a sinless humanity. Okay? So he has to be conceived of God. So this was done to remove any legal ties to Adam and to have a holy and sinless man who was fit to be both sacrificed and high priest according to the regulations of Leviticus 22 and 23, that there were to be no blemish on the sacrifice as well as on the priesthood. Okay? If Jesus acquired anything from Adam, that was not by imputation, which means by a legal transfer, then there would still be need of another sinless man to represent us. And that means here and now, we would still be hopeless in our sins. But when Jesus appeared, this is what he said of himself, describing his mission to us. And this is from Luke 4, 18 to 19. And that is a quotation from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Lord came and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I don't know about these preachers who have an anointing who don't preach the gospel. <laughs> they have an anointing for finance. They have an anointing for all kinds of foolishness, but it has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. This is what Jesus said. When the Spirit of God is upon a person, they preach the gospel. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, or to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that language of proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor is coming from Leviticus 25, the year of the Jubilee, proclaiming liberty to all the inhabitants of the land who may have been in captivity or sold themselves to slavery because of indebtedness. I went to Leviticus 25 trying to see if I could 
isolate some nuggets and I discovered that I was going to end up with a totally another message. I was like, okay, uh, it looks like we need three messages from Leviticus 25. Because the year of Jubilee is one of the most popular places that the Pentecostals and all these foolish guys love to go to. Okay, and they'll just be spinning it and <laughs> it's crazy. But we're going to have to do a message from Leviticus 25. There's just way too many gospel nuggets to not preach it. Okay, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to try and cut anything here. <laughs> but this is what the Lord was saying. He came on a spiritual mission to go to war in a spiritual way to set the captives free. And he even said, if the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So we were set free when he appeared. That's what he came to do. We were not set free when we appeared in our flip-flops and with a sippy cup. That's not when it happened. And since he appeared, there are no elect people who are still under condemnation. I know this offends a lot of people, but it is not correct to say that we still have elect, elect people who are under condemnation when their Savior came and paid for their sins. Okay? Even if those elect people are ignorant of it, their ignorance does not cause condemnation. It's just ignorance. God will cure their ignorance. God will bring them to the truth of who they truly are in Christ in the appointed time because the transaction was completed for all the elect in the one person and in the one time, in the one appointed place, Mount Calvary. He perfected for all time the sanctified. All the sanctified, all the elect were perfected in the one offering of Christ when he did offer himself. Okay? So a sinner is not removed from condemnation by their faith or by their knowledge. Romans 5 will deny that. You are not removed from condemnation by your faith. The very knowledgeable of the Christians and the suckling in the faith, those who can barely spell their name, have the same standing before God as long as they are elect. Because they have the same resume of Christ. All the elect have the same resume of Christ Jesus. So it's not about your depth of knowledge of Christ. Even as much as I know about Jesus, there's a whole lot more that I don't know about him. So my salvation cannot be made dependent on my knowledge of him. I continue to increase in knowledge and for all of eternity, I'm going to keep learning but that does not increase my righteousness before him or my standing before him, okay? So justified by faith means justified by something that happened outside of yourself. And what happened outside of yourself is Christ. <laughs> it is the cross. And you were there in the same way that you were in Adam. You were not in the Garden of Eden, but you were there by union. You were not on Mount Calvary, but you were there by union. Okay? So that's how this thing works. So the sinner is brought 
to the knowledge of their being set free through faith and the preaching of the gospel. So we preach the gospel so that to as many as were granted eternal life, they believe God who caused them to believe. But we were made righteous when he died. Almost closing. What about the law then? Where does the law fit into this puzzle? You see, it doesn't matter what you tell people about God's grace in salvation as totally sufficient. They still want law. <laughs> and Paul answers to that. And he says, this is how it works, verse 20. Moreover, the law ended that the offense might abound. Wow, I thought you would say something better than that, Paul. I thought you'd say the law ended that people may show their love to God. <laughs> no, moreover, the law ended. And ended is literally came alongside. The law came alongside to increase sin. Because the more commandments you give to a sinner, the more sins they commit. If I give you 5,000 commandments to observe for the next five days, guess what? You're going to be breaking them before you even leave this place. The more commandments I give you, the more you break. So the law was given not to help you, but to increase your sin. Okay? So, with that, we now have the triangle of death. Because Paul has been working sin and death Sin and death, and now he introduces law back to the conversation. Sin, law, and death. The sting of sin is death, and the power of sin is in the law. So once you introduce law, you're going to arouse the sin that was already there, and when you mix the two in the pot, they bring not life but death, okay? And many who claim to do the law do not know this e equation, sin, law, and death. Paying your bills on time is not keeping the law. Not getting a speeding ticket is not law keeping. If that were the case, then there would be no hope for Matilda. <laughs> <laughs> what we do here and now means nothing in the matter of God's law. God's law is way higher. It demands perfection. Okay. Hear what Paul said in Romans 7, 8. In the matter of law and sin, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, sin will take opportunity, advantage of any commandment that's given, produce in me all manner of evil desire. So as soon as the commandment is given, suddenly sin is at work. For apart from the law, sin was dead. But when the law came, I died. So that equation of sin, law, and death, that conversation comes together. And it comes together because of the first Adam. Understand this? Sin, death, and law are things that exist for you in the first Adam. 
Those are the matters of the old creation. Please, sin, law, death, the flesh, those are in the realm of the old Adam. In the new creation, you have Jesus, you have the spirit, you have life, you have righteousness. It's a different conversation. It's a different bracket. Understand, know the difference of these things. Okay? That is how things work. But this is what God has done outside of you and me. But where sin abounded, that's going to be our last verse. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Where sin abounded, where sin increased to seemingly great proportions. Men and women going crazy. People are saying, oh, I think God is judging our nation for our sins. Because the sins have gotten so great now, God has no more ability to serve. He can only judge them. Right? You hear that a lot. Like, oh, yeah, I think things have gotten so out of control now. God has to bring judgment. Not God has to bring salvation. No, no. Let him bring judgment now. I think it's time for judgment. God says, guess what? Grace abounded much more. And that means hyper grace. That's the proper translation. It's hyper grace. And that means Lady Gaga <laughs> and the friends have not sinned beyond or to the levels of exhausting God's ability to save them if they are elect. No one ever sins above God's ability to save. I do not think Lady Gaga is the worst of sinners. You and I are the worst of sinners. Everyone should call themselves the worst of sinners. That is appropriate. Because we have ability to sin more than anybody else. But this is what God is saying, there's no elect person who ever sins to the level that God runs out of grace to save them. Because if that were the case, you become the sovereign one. And God becomes the finite one. God becomes the powerless one. You become the omnipotent sinner. There's not a single sin of yours that you have ever done and will ever do that will come close to using up God's grace if he so desires your salvation. God's grace cannot run out. It is not affected by covid induced supply chain issues. There are no supply chain issues when it comes to God's grace. It is always abundant. The Greek word means abounded much more, abounded much more. To abound beyond measure. You can't measure it. You can bring your buckets you fill them all, and still <laughs> it's more than the waters of the seas and the oceans. Abound exceedingly, overflowing. It's hyper grace. That's where hyper grace comes from. The grace of God did much more abound. And have you heard some people saying they're worried? about the constant preaching of 
hyper grace or just grace. And they'll say with that, that is antinomian. You can't just be preaching grace. Like it is too much grace. Like they actually have something better to offer than hyper grace. And for them, it is saying, do not talk too much about grace. Do not talk too much about Christ. Leave me some little law for me to do. Too much grace will leave me with nothing to do for my salvation. I want to feel good about myself. When I tick all my achievements, and my flesh does not like it. My flesh does not like it if and when you don't leave me something to do. People want things to do. And that is why when you talk grace, they always come and say, but how are you living? <laughs> okay. They want to make the conversation about you when the conversation is actually outside of yourself. It's about God. It's about Christ. Okay. But grace did abound much more. And it happened in the past tense because the grace has already been bestowed. Grace will always be on top of sin. That's what that is saying. Grace is always and will always be on top of sin. It doesn't matter the sin. It will always be on top. Never below. <laughs> Your sin can never rise above grace. It's impossible. How is that? This one, one. So that a sin reigned in death. Even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin reigned during its time in death. In his appointed time. But since the advent of Jesus, there's been a change of masters, a change of the power dynamics. Grace reigns through the righteousness of Christ to eternal life for the redeemed. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. The writer of Hebrews says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet with our sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In other words, when sin seems to have overtaken you. Don't run away from Jesus and say, oh, I, I'm just working to clean up my life and then I'll come back to Jesus. No, you're not going to clean up your life. You're going to make a mess of it. God says, come to the throne of grace because Christ is the one who is sitting on the throne of grace. The throne of grace is not a throne of the judgment of your sins that you are doing. It is the throne to give you help, to give you a clean conscience, to remind you of your justification, of your righteousness, of your acceptance, of your being loved. Come boldly. Don't have anything get in the way. Even your sin, don't let it get in the way of your boldness to come to Christ. And seek help. And say, Lord, help me. Okay? So, 
the Lord Jesus sitting on that throne of grace, reigning to eternal life, not to sin and not to death. And we'll prepare to land this way, by way of summary. This is what Paul is saying, or this is what God is saying. There was and there is the one man, Adam, and there was and there is the one man, Christ. Those are the only two people who matter. And it matters in which of the two you die in. Ultimately, that's what matters. Are you, are, are you in Christ? Does your story end in Christ or it dead ends in Adam? That's the issue. So from verse 15, he has said, One man's trespass, many died. And by another man's grace, the one man, the gift of grace, righteousness has come to many. Okay? Verse 16 one man, Adam, judgment and condemnation. Many trespasses, and yet with the one man, Christ, the gift resulted in justification. Not just for the one offense, but for even all your trespasses. Verse 17. Through the one man's trespass, Adam, death reigned. And through the one man, Christ Jesus, believers reign in life. In Adam is reign of death. In Christ is reign in life. Verse 18. One trespass, condemnation for all men. One act of righteousness by the one man, justification given to all men in Christ. Verse 19. Disobedience of the one man, and many were constituted sinners. The obedience of the one, that is Christ, many constituted righteous. Verse 21. Sin reigned in death because of the one man. But because of Christ, grace reigns to results in it brings eternal life or has brought eternal life. And this is God's gospel. It's lazy boy gospel. <laughs> and it is free. Amen. We are done. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the teaching of the Holy Spirit from the Scriptures, of the relation of things between the one man, Adam, and the one man, Christ Jesus. The one man, Adam, bringing sin, death, and condemnation, and the Lord Jesus reversing and even bringing better things righteousness and justification and eternal life. We thank you for these words. We pray that the Holy Spirit will form faith in your people, that they may see how they relate to God, not through the old men, but through the new men, not through the old creation, but through the new creation of Christ. We pray for your people, wherever they are, for these who joined to listen. Bless them in every way in Christ. May you keep them, provide for them, and continue to grant them the joy and the hope of Christ. We honor you, glorify you. In all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good people. Be praying for us. We'll see you. Soon, Lord willing. All right.